Faithful viewers of this broadcast know that from time to time, we ask poets to drop by and share their work with us. This time, our guest is the versatile Philip Appleman, whose creativity spans a long life filled with verse, fiction, philosophy, science, religion, and above all, moments of everyday experience captured like the glint of the sun sparkling through a crystal glass. Just take a look at a sample of his legacy. Darwin, Apes and Angels, Darwin's Ark. In the twelfth year of the war, open doorways, and this, my favorite, summer love and surf, about the joys and wonders of loving and living. His latest book of poems is Perfidious Proverbs. A fellow poet said that to watch Philip Appleman sling words is to be richly regaled. I quite agree. Welcome, Philip. <laughs> Wonderful to be here, Bill. I have long thought of poetry as music to be heard best in the voice of the composer. So let's go right to some of your poems. Good. I love it. Here's one of my favorites, and I think it's one of your favorites too, Eve. Tell oh, me yeah. about that poem. Twenty years ago, I published a book called Let There Be Light. It was a series of satires on various biblical stories, and uh, Eve being one of the first uh, came out at the head of the list. And uh, shall I read it? Please. <laughs> Eve is kind of reflecting on the, uh, on the snake at first. Clever he was, so slick he could weave words into sunshine. When he murmured another refrain of that shimmering promise, you shall be as gods. Something with wings whispered back in my heart, and I crunched the apple. A taste so good I just had to share it with Adam. And all of a sudden, we were naked. Oh yes, we were nude before, but now, grabbing for fig leaves, we knew that we knew too much, just as the slippery serpent said. So we crouched all day under the rhododendrons, trembling at something bleak and windswept in our bellies that soon we'd learn to call by its right name, fear. God was furious with the snake and hacked off his legs on the spot. And for us, it was thorns and thistles, sweat of the brow, dust to dust returning. In that sizzling sky full of spite whirled the whole black storm of the future, the flint knife in Abel's heart, the incest that swelled us into a tribe, a nation, and brought us all like driven lambs straight to his flood. I blamed it on human nature even then, when there were only two humans around. And if human nature was a mistake, whose mistake was it? I didn't ask to be cursed with curiosity. I only wanted the apple, and of course, that promise to be like gods. But then, maybe we are like gods. Maybe we're all exactly like gods. And maybe that's our really original sin. <laughs> the original sin, hubris, right? <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah. You've said that's one of your favorites. What makes it a favorite? Well, I like the, uh, the, the personal tone of Eve, who you know, doesn't get to say anything in the Bible to speak of, and, uh, and to turn her into a kind of down-to-earth reinterpreter of that. Uh, kind of tickles me, that's all. She finally gets to tell her own story. Right. <laughs> Did you ever wonder about the silence in that story of the first woman, as it says? Yeah. No woman I know would tolerate it. <laughs> exactly. Now, there, here's one that we like especially. It's uh, one of the five poems of pagans that you, uh, you did, and, th and this is one of the short ones. Would you read that one? And, and by the way, tell us what mammon is for those who haven't been reading the Bible lately. Well, Mammon is the love of money and greed, and uh, he's the god of, of uh, wealth. I call it my Bernie Madoff poem. <laughs> <laughs> Read on. <laughs> oh, Mammon, thou who art daily dissed by everyone, yet boast more true disciples than all other gods together. Thou whose eerie sheen gleameth from corporate headquarters and Vatican treasury alike, 
Thou whose glittering eye impales us in the X-ray vision of plastic surgeons, the golden leer of televangelists, the star-spangled gloat of politicos. O oh, mammon, come down to us in the form of treasuries, annuities, and high-grade bonds. Yield unto us those Benedict Arnold funds, those quicksand convertible securities, even the wet Judas kiss of futures contracts. For unto the least of these, thy supplicants, art thou welcome in all thy many forms. But when thou comest to say we're finally in the gentry, use the service entry. <laughs> <laughs> Do you ever go back and say, well, that's one of my first children. I mean, I remember, yeah. I'd forgotten that kid, but now I realize that it, yeah. it, it is my poem. Yeah, I, I love uh, reading the early poems as much as the late ones. I brought along a poem, uh, which uh, it, it would be an interruption sort of of the, of the uh, thrust here, but... That's what uh, life is about, a series of constant <laughs> interruptions, Philip. Go ahead. The, the first thing you see uh, in, in, the, in this book is a dedication. It's for Margie, my wife. We're looking forward to our 62nd anniversary this summer. And uh, the dedication says, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. But because Margie is home and uh, has had a stroke and is ill, uh, I would like to write a po read a poem for her, if you don't mind. Please do. It's from a book called Summer Love and Surf which uh, came out in 1968, and it's the most beautiful book. It was uh, so beautifully designed that it won the, uh, oh, the it is. design contest for that year. And it was written when we were living out in Malibu in one of those houses that build on stilts, and it's so far on the beach that at high tide, the ocean is gurgling under your bed, bedroom, and uh, we loved it there. And uh, this is a young love poem. And in recent years, I've written poems for our 50th anniversary and our 60th anniversary, which are very old love poems, but this is sort of back at the beginning. Summer Love and Surf. Morning was hesitating when you swam at me through wave on wave of sheet and blanket, glowing like some dimly sighted flora at the bottom of the sea. Around your filmy hair, light was seeping in with water sounds, low growling in the distance like dragons chained. After our small storm dwindled, we faced the rage outside, swells humping up and charging in to curl and pause and dash themselves to soap suds on the stork plagued pilings of our house. The roar was hoarser now, the wrecks of kelp were heaping food for flies, our long-nosed sandbirds staying close to dry land. Farther out, pelicans arched their wings in quick surprise, and gulls screamed urgently. The call was there. We fought the breakers out and rode their fury back triumphant, and again triumphant, till at last, ears stuffed with brine and heads a-spin like aging boxers battered, we flopped face down on hot sand, smelling sun and salt, and steaming skin. Your eyes were suddenly all sleep and love, there in the sun with seabirds calling. The sky goes metal at the end, water gray and hostile lashing out between the day and night. Plastic swans are threatened. Deck chairs, yellow towels, barbecues stand naked to the peril as if it were winter come by stealth. Still later, in the lee of dark and warmth, we probe the ancient fear. At night, the sea is safer under glass, the crude wild thing half tamed to shed its past. Galleons sent to 50 fathoms, mountains hacked to rubble, cities stripped. At night, the sea, barbaric bellows stifled, sprawls outside the window framed like a dark, unruly landscape. Behind us, is a darker kind of dark. I watch your eyes for signals. The music makes a pause for prophecy. Tomorrow, offshore breezes and warmth to each other's warmth. We do not listen. That was how long ago? 1968. 
And you had been married? We had been married 18 years at that point. <laughs> How does love change from then to now? It gets more profound, uh, more, uh, more essential. It was very strong right from the beginning. We met on the first day of French class at Northwestern University in 1946, and we've been uh, together ever since. She became a playwright, didn't she? She is a playwright, and her plays have been produced about 60 times, mostly in New York and Los Angeles. I appreciate her work on my poetry and other things I write. She is a wonderful critic. Four years ago, she had a stroke, and uh, that kind of put an end to her writing. So uh, that was a very sad thrust. I'm curious as to this poem, this year's Valentine. Where did that come from? What's it about? I wrote this right after the Twin Towers went down. This was a, a poem I wrote for the next Valentine's Day. They could pump frenzy into air ducts and rage into reservoirs, dynamite dams and drown the cities, cry fire in theaters as the victims are burning. But I will find my way through blackened streets and kneel down at your side. They could jump the median head on and obliterate the future, fit 45s to the hands of kids and skate them off to school, flip live butts into tinderbox forests and hellfire half the heavens. But in the rubble of smoking cottages, I will hold you in my arms. They could send kidnappers to kindergartens and pedophiles to playgrounds, wrap themselves in old glory and gut the Bill of Rights, pound at the door with holy screed and put an end to reason. But I will cut through their curtains of cunning and find you somewhere in moonlight. Whatever they do with their anthrax or chainsaws, however they strip search or brainwash or blackmail, they cannot prevent me from sending you robins, all of them singing. I'll be there. A year after 9-11 in that huge climate of fear, how could you have such faith in love? It's always been there for me, and uh, it, it, it keeps me consciously aware that I'm not alone on this earth yet. <laughs> We're up in our 80s now, so there will be a time sometime soon when I will be alone. But. Uh, while I'm here, the thing that I most value is that love. Is that the source of the meaning in your life? I mean, you had this remarkable essay that had a profound impact on me a few years ago on how the meaning of life comes out of the moment you're acting, out of your choices every moment of how you will live that life. Meaning is not out there, you say. It is in the doing of the moment. Right. You create your own definition, you create your own meaning as you act. I was brought up in a small Indiana town, uh, went to a fundamentalist church, and when I was about 13, thought my mission was to be a, a missionary to darkest Africa and bring the message. Uh, that, that cleared away in a couple of years later. But uh, Why did it clear away? I kept reading books and finding out things, and uh, after a while I realized that what I believed in didn't have much to do with reality. And uh, I studied Catholicism for a while, and I went on to, to, to take on all the other belief systems. I read all the holy books of uh, you know, the Koran and the Buddhists and the Hindus, and I spent years doing that, searching for the meaning of life out there. You know, and. Uh, Eventually, uh, having gone through it all, uh, decided I had to decide on these things for myself. And so I left the holy books behind and uh, started making my own philosophy of life, which pretty much is in the essay you were talking about. So I consider myself a humanist, not just an atheist, but a humanist. Which means? Means someone who wishes he could work for the betterment of the human condition without reference to supernatural thing. Well, you do often in your poems. I think of another poem that also has been a favorite of mine called simply Gertrude. Would you tell me about this one and read it? Yes, my 
My mother was one of those saintly mothers that some of us are lucky enough to have. Her name was Gertrude, and uh, she was struck by rheumatoid arthritis when she was about uh, 40 and spent a great part of her life after that uh, in bed or in a wheelchair or something. She was hit very hard, and, and all of her children, my three sisters and I, uh, did everything we could to help, but nothing worked. And finally, uh, she died at the age of 75. I wish that all the people who peddle God could watch my mother die, could see the skin and gristle weighing only 79, every stubborn pound of flesh a small death. I wish the people who peddle God could see her young, lovely in gardens and beautiful in kitchens, and could watch the hand of God slowly twisting her knees and fingers till they gnarled and knotted, settling in for 30 years of pain. I wish the people who peddle God could see the lightning of his cancer striking her, the small frame tensing at every shock, her sweet contralto scratchy with the Lord's infection. Philip, I want to die. I wish I had them gathered round, those preachers, popes, rabbis, imams, priests, every pious shill on God's payroll, and I would pull the sheets from my mother's brittle body, and they would fall on their knees at her bedside to be forgiven all their faith. That's very powerful, and in contrast to all of the people, both of us know some of them who find faith the consolation at the time of death. That's uh, mm -hmm. intriguing how the human beings uh, walk such different yeah. paths when it comes to religion. Yeah. When Margie's mother died, uh, she was another, another saint, but uh, she died uh, regretting to herself all the sins she had had in her life. And of course, she hadn't really had any sins, but a little, little shortcoming, she forgot to say thank you to someone or something like that. And uh, the whole thing came crashing in on her, and she was convinced she was going to go to hell. If this one is uh, from Karma, Dharma, Pudding, and Pie. Uh, will you read that? This poem has an epigraph from Job. And it says, God will laugh at the trial of the innocent. The poem is called God's Grandeur. When they hunger and thirst, and I send down a famine, when they pray for the sun and I drown them with rain, and they beg me for reasons, my only reply is, I never apologize, never explain. When the angel of death is a black wind around them and children are dying in terrible pain, then they burn little candles in churches, but still I never apologize, never explain. When the Christians kill Jews, and Jews kill the Muslims, and Muslims kill writers they think are profane, they clamor for peace or for reasons at least. But I never apologize, never explain. When they wail about murder and torture and rape, and unlucky Abel complains about Cain, and they ask me just why I had planned it like this, I never apologize, never explain. Of course, if they're smart, they can figure it out. The best of all reasons is perfectly plain. It's because I just happen to like it this way. So I never apologize, never explain. Job kept asking why. Poor thing, yeah. And never got an answer. No. Jesus himself, oh God, why hast thou forsaken me? Right, yeah. No answer. Yeah. I'm not uh, so impervious to uh, the world that I don't know that religion does a lot of good sometimes. Uh, that, that some, some religious people really are good and they want to do good. Um, but unfortunately, so many religious people uh, let the religions lead them into hatred. Let's, let's have a little fun with uh, one from Perfidious Proverbs. It's actually called Parable of the Perfidious Proverbs. And Proverb, as people I hope know, is an epigram of wisdom contained in the book of Proverbs in, the, in, in, in what Christians call the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. Probably, yeah. How better it is to get wisdom than gold. 
money buys prophets and teachers, poems and art. So listen, if you're so rich, why aren't you smart? He that spareth his rod hateth his son. That line gives you a perfect way of testing your inner feelings about child molesting. He that maketh haste to be rich shall not be innocent. But here at the parish, we don't find it overly hard to accept his dirty cash or credit card. Hope deferred maketh the heart sick. That's just why the good Lord made it mandatory to eat your heart out down in purgatory. Wisdom is better than rubies. Among the jeweled bishops and other boobies, it's also a whole lot rarer than rubies. And he that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. Trusting your heart may not be awfully bright, but trusting Proverbs is an idiot's delight. I like that. I like <laughs> that. That's from Pervidious Proverbs, which is your new book. What, what gives you happiness? What gives you joy? Poetry does, music does, theater does, but mostly I think it's just having my wife and uh, living quietly and uh, enjoying being together. I think that's the, the greatest thing in my life. Philip Appleman, thank you very much for being with me. Thank you.